All right, welcome all. Thank you for coming to this evening's talk. I'm delighted to have you here in the room, but particularly delighted to have Professor Netta Crawford here. She's coming to us from, from Oxford, where she's the Montague Burton Chair in International Relations, and she also holds a professorial fellowship at Balliol College. And I'm delighted because Netta's work tackles big and important questions. Uh, and often these are questions which are ignored by many other mainstream IR scholars. And I have used a number of her work actually in, in my classes in IR theories. Some of you are in the room that have taken or, or are taking um, my class. Her work uh, canvases some big topics like war, ethics, the end of colonialism, emotions in world politics, and now climate change in the military. She's written a number of books, including Accountability for Killing, Moral Responsibility for Collateral Damage in America's Post-9-11 Wars, An Argument and Change in World Politics, Ethics, Decolonization, and Humanitarian Intervention. And that last book, um, published with Cambridge University Press, won, uh, was a co-winner of the 2003 American Political Science Association Jervis and Schroeder Award for Best Book in International History and Politics. And I can say, separate from today's talk, it's an amazing book, which I would really encourage you read because it tackles how ethical arguments um, helped end colonialism and how the shifts around what people uh, thought about colonialism in, in Western metropoles changed over time because people no longer, Westerners no longer thought it was acceptable to control others in precisely the same way. So Crawford's work has, ever, as I've said, Professor uh, Crawford's, Crawford's work has has um, covered a real broad range of areas. And tonight she'll be speaking on her latest book, The Pentagon, Climate Change and War, Charting the Rise and Fall of U.S. Military Emissions. And I read this book over summer. It's a fascinating read, partly because it's the first book, to my knowledge, that actually goes in deep to count and to calculate, rather, greenhouse gas emissions of, uh, of the U.S. military. And she points out in this book, and I won't steal her thunder, um, that the U.S. military is the single largest institutional fossil fuel user in the world. You just stole it. Well, there you go. You can add more thunder. Which, when I read this, I just quite couldn't quite believe it. It's it's really remarkable that we don't do more talking about it, both from the military side of things and from the climate and uh, global environmental politics side. There's very little work in global environmental politics that is, has kind of made this point so clearly. So I think it's a very important contribution, both to those of you, who are, to all of those of you in the room who are here from security studies, those of you who are here in the room who are thinking about global environmental politics, who are thinking about warfare. These are really important um, uh, points that the book uh, raises. So I won't steal any more of your thunder then, because there's a lot more uh, to be made from the book. I'm going to hand over um, to Netta. She'll speak for around 30 minutes. And then we'll open up the floor to Q&A. And please feel free to ask questions. Also, if any of you are joining online, um, please type your questions um, in the Q&A and we will also uh, engage with those questions. So I'll hand over to you. Well, I'm really happy to be here in Bologna. And I really uh, appreciate the opportunity to talk to you um, at this moment. Okay, so I'm going to do a fairly sweeping and fast talk because I only have 30 minutes and I have so much to say. So anybody who can't follow me, um, ask me later. All right. What I want to do um, right now, though, is quickly, so it's not going to I guess we have to do a little quicker. give you a sense not not ready it did that okay well I'll, I'll just tell you what i'm planning to do while this is being sorted yeah there we go thank you that one okay um is uh talk about what military emissions are sort of in in general and how i'm thinking about them and how People are in general thinking about them. Some causal arrows, because we're social scientists, and we like causal arrows, that's our big tool. What I call the deep cycle and some other stuff. 
uh, DOD emissions, in particular U.S. military emissions, the consequences of climate change as militaries understand them, and uh, emergent consensus on climate change and conflict. There we go. So uh, I'm hoping that you can, can you guys see that? If not, move forward. I'm hoping that you are familiar with the basic greenhouse gases. And if you're not, raise your hand. Just... Okay. So mostly what we're talking about is carbon dioxide from military uh, emissions. But when you talk about military industrial emissions, you'll be talking about everything. Okay. And sometimes if you're talking about biogenic emissions, you'll be talking about methane. But for the most part, we're talking about carbon dioxide. And I'm using CO2 equivalent using the standard United Nations um, UN Framework Convention formula for deriving CO2 equivalent. Okay, so that's where we're at. And this is an image that it sort of puts U.S. military emissions in perspective. This is the um, Forbes uh, using a paper I published in 2019, did this really cute picture, which is basically it's still the same. Um, U.S. military emissions, that is the DOD's emissions from installations and operations in, in 2017, this particular year, were more than the emissions of Morocco, Peru, Sweden, Hungary. In fact, U.S. military emissions in that particular year, 59 million metric tons CO2 equivalent, were more than all the countries in Africa, except for South Africa, right? all the sub-Saharan African countries, except for that one fairly industrialized country, um, is added up. Okay, so that's important to understand. But there's more to it than the emissions from, let's say, installations and operations, which I will quantify for you. But there are things we don't know. We don't understand yet. We haven't quantified yet the emissions that come from burning large urban areas like as uh, was done in World War II um, and is occurring now in major cities. Okay, we haven't really quantified the emissions that are related to war-caused deforestation. And war-caused deforestation is um, sometimes deliberate, as in the, when the United States Union Army burned the forests of the south, the Shenandoah Valley, in this image on the left. And uh, when the Union Army cut down road uh, trees to make roads, what were called corduroy roads. And those roads, you can find them today, in fact, underneath. Um, those were very effective in moving uh, heavy wagons and cannon and so on, where you couldn't otherwise move them. And um, then another thing happened in, the, in uh, the Civil War, which is a lot of trees were destroyed actually in the forest. They had what were called ghost forests. But there's, in addition to that, the destruction of oil infrastructure in war. This is usually deliberate. Um, one side wants the other side not to have access to the oil that is there. And then that can start either uh, fires which don't go out for months or sometimes longer, or it can cause the release of methane, which is a very potent greenhouse gas, more potent than carbon dioxide. Again, we haven't quantified that. So I'm going to give you what I know for sure and give you the sense of what is not known. So then here's another one where the, there was an estimate of the uh, emissions from this. I think it was 60 million metric tons, I'm not sure. Um, I, I don't actually remember the, the estimate, but we, I, we don't really know how much methane was released with this, but there is an estimate for the de deliberate destruction of the Nord Stream 1 and 2 pipelines. Oh, at least I assume it was deliberate. Okay, and then there's another kind of destruction with the defoliants. And here we're talking about the loss of sequestration potential that is sucking up the carbon and uh, um, in the atmosphere. And with the chemical defoliants, it, it takes a long time to recover. But 
when forests recover, of course, they do, young trees do sequester, that is store carbon at a faster rate than older trees. So there's hope there. So again, this was deliberate. And then after um, the Vietnam War, where this destruction occurred, um, there was a, a law that said uh, you should not engage in deliberate destruction of the environment in war. 1975, it's an international convention. Okay, now causal arrows and the problem of time. Okay, so I'm going to talk about causal arrows going one way, and then I'm going to talk about recursion. That is, um, uh, paths were, were uh, caught, uh, path dependent processes recur and they're reinforced. So the dominant understanding of the cause of climate change is the industrial revolution um, leads to greater burning of fossil fuels, in particular coal, in the 19th century. And then, um, you know, when we see the introduction of oil and natural gas, that is, you know, uh, a big burst in carbon emissions. And I don't disagree with the Industrial Revolution explanation of the causes of climate change, but I want to complicate it a little bit. And here's here's an, uh, a statement sort of giving the the standard view, which is the Industrial Revolution leads to climate change. That is um, essentially correct, right? You can complicate that by talking about agriculture and changes in agricultural practices and deforestation, but this is the, the main cause. Okay, and then what we see here is a view of the CO2 emissions as because CO2 emissions actually don't like go up and come down. The carbon cycle is broken. They stay up there a long time. Carbon cycle is broken because we have too much CO2 in the atmosphere, cannot be absorbed back into the oceans or in swamps or in trees. And so this, the cumulative emissions here are the big industrial countries, right? So the United States has the largest cumulative emissions profile, followed by China and um, the Soviet Union slash Russia. Okay. Um, but there's another way to think about it. War can and expansion and, and military industrialization can actually cause cooling. Um, this occurred in the conquest of the Americas in uh, a period when in Latin America, there were uh, about, uh, or in all North and South America in the early 1500s, there were about 100 million people within um, 100 years, there were 10 million people. And in Latin America in particular, much of that land was not forested, but much of it was in fact being farmed. And when that land returned after the death of those people through war and disease to forest very rapidly, this actually has been associated with a, a drop of temperatures and what they called the little ice age. And it's a very interesting paper that you can read about uh, this in the quaternary science reviews in 2019. And why I tell you this is that um, things can reverse. They can, they can, we can have, have global cooling. War has impacts both ways potentially. And so also uh, the global nuclear stockpile, rather large, but much less large than let's say in the mid 1980s or late 1980s, um, if used uh, just a few hundred weapons, this would have the effect of cooling the atmosphere rather dramatically. And in fact, causing a drop in uh, global food production, which would lead to mass starvation because we don't have enough food stockpile to live, let's say more than six months a year in most places. So that's the nuclear winter work that was done in the mid 1980s and then most recently revisited by some physicists and chemists at uh, Rutgers mostly. Um, so war can cause cooling. 
War can lead to warming. And that's what I'm talking about mostly today. The indirect ways that I've talked about, the destruction of the environment and, and also infrastructure, and then the direct emissions of both um, military industry and operations and installations. So um, quickly, a brief history of military fuel use. We go rather rapidly from you know, human powered or animal powered locomotion in the 19th century to industrial scale locomotion powered by steam engines in, you know, the 1830s, 40s, 50s. And this causes uh, the great powers, Britain and the US, uh, uh, up and coming great power, to set up coaling stations wherever they could. And you see here the British coaling stations, which the U.S. was able to use in its own expansion. Or, um, And you see on the lower left the Great White Fleet, which was Roosevelt's sort of announcement that the United States was a great power, sending it, uh, doing a circumnavigation of the globe. Those emissions, by the way, from the Great White Fleet, which burned uh, bituminous coal, hence the black tail there, um, are still in the atmosphere, most of them. So coal was considered essential. It was called the lifeblood of the man of war, of war itself, and coaling stations were essential. You get you have an interest in keeping these coaling stations. You, you make arrangements with other powers. Um, you know, for instance, the United States goes to Hawaii, sets up a coaling station, um, then goes to Japan, has an arrangement with the Japanese to, to have a uh, refueling, and you've got diplomatic and uh, military relationships established. So the United States then takes over Hawaii, um, and then, of course, it's not a choice whether or not to have the, the base there. Okay, so World War One, the idea was that oil was essential. In fact, coal is still very important in World War I, but they, they saw the introduction of oil as a real innovation. But of course, then that means you need to have access to oil and the, the it's not just coaling stations now, you need to have access to Persian Gulf oil. And then the, the British make diplomatic and uh, commercial arrangements with the Emirates, um, with the uh, local political figures and um, set up companies as do other um, corporate entities. And it's all defended by the British Navy. And then of course the United States takes over this role in large part in the 1960s. But you, you need to have that um, access you believe because it's so vital. But of course um, war has other effects. Um, it is tremendously uh, stimulating of innovation and of the civilian sector. And in particular, um, the aviation sector is the civil aviation sector is bolstered by the military aviation sector. And um, you know, in the post World War II period, as well as in the post World War I period. Aircraft are, are given away to commercial um, operators so that they can start the aviation industry and, and uh, run it at a profit. And then uh, what you also see is uh, after World War I and World War II, moving away from nitrates for explosives to nitrates for fertilizer. So the same plant that's making the fertilizer in uh, World War One, and and then actually in uh, I'm sorry the the, uh, the bombs in World War One the, the nitroglycerin the TNT for bombs then turns to make fertilizer and then goes back to making nitroglycerin and uh, then turns to make fertilizer and nitrate based fertilizers are supported essentially by military production so they they have to have something to do with this factory. And they do. And so what you see is these ripple effects in an entire economy, the civil aviation industry, the agricultural industry, and then of course the highways that are part of the 
uh, movement of military equipment from one coast to the other in the U.S., and also supposed to facilitate evacuation in case of nuclear war. That was the, the stated purpose of the interstate highway and defense system at that time. So what I'm describing is what I call this deep cycle, where you have this cheap and versatile fuel. Um, there's a lot of demand for it in the civil and military sectors. Then this shapes the infrastructure. Then you need to maintain that supply. And then uh, you get agree uh, agreements with others, commercial agreements and um, diplomatic arrangements to maintain that supply. And then you want to protect the price of that. So, but of course you're insecure. You don't want others to control the price or the access to it. And so sometimes um, what you do is you build up more forces and uh, more arrangements to protect it. But then all of that requires military stuff. That is bases and um, access to ports and then then you become like the United States or Britain in the Persian Gulf with tens of thousands of people based there to maintain access to fuel at a certain price. And then sometimes you go to war to protect access to that fuel. So what we have, um, you know, I I studied the big one, the United States. It, it's They say the Defense Logistics Agency that their footprint is global. Indeed it is. They have many distribution centers all over the world so to make sure that fuel gets to the military wherever it is. And why is that? That's because the United States has bases everywhere in the world. At um, its peak in the Cold War, there were about 2,000 bases and installations. And um, during the 1980s, there was a reduction in those, I'm sorry, the 1990s or after the end of the Cold War, there was a reduction in the number of those installations and bases. Some of them were closed. Some of them were consolidated, um, base realignment and closure. And then uh, what you see for much of the uh, 1990s is about a thousand bases. And then right now, I think there's about 700 or 800 bases and installations around the globe. Okay, now I'm coming to the, the punchline, which you stole, which is of course, um, U.S. military emissions are enormous, right? They're about one to two percent, between one and two percent of total U.S. emissions. So they're not a big part of that huge economy's emissions. It was until recently the largest economy in the world, the United States. Now it's second to China. Um, it's military emissions at one percent of all U.S. emissions are still enormous. And it, as a sector, as an institution, as a thing, it is the United States' single largest energy user, which the DOD will tell you proudly and how they meet their energy needs is a, a large part of what the Defense Logistics Agency does. And so what you see here right in this image is the pattern of emissions. And what you notice a couple things here. One is that they're high. Uh, at the tail end of the Vietnam War, they declined. They went up during Reagan's Cold War buildup. Then they, um, th then I have an anomalous number, which I'm not really happy with there. But and then in in the Gulf War, they go up again. Uh, they reach a peak, at 110 million metric tons. And then they decline with the base realignment and closure that I talked about, the end of the Cold War. And um, then they go up in the 9-11 wars again, right? So war drives emissions. That's the story here. Or mobilization for it. So lots of exercises in the Cold War, lots of emissions. Okay, because there's two sources for emissions here from the military. There's operational emissions, which is exercises and fighting training, and there's installations. Okay. And here's a little image of the source of those emissions. Um, essentially, what you see here are, is that much of it is aircraft. The purple are, are planes of all sorts. And you can also see that uh, NORTHCOM, that is North America, that uses most of the fuel, the energy for the US, 
um, military, but it's distributed in the other commands, European Command, uh, now it's called Indo-Pacific Command, um, Central Command. And they couldn't, in this particular year, there's a UNK up there, unknown. They don't know where some of that fuel went. And then South Command is, is low. Okay, but then we also need to think about the, the military industrial emissions. And this is the untold thing that we want to keep track of. And here, what I, I just want to point out that they are also declining, which is really interesting. Um, I can speculate as to why, but um, and we can talk about it. But but I these are the top, the three top US military contractors uh, in terms of military equipment sold to either the United States or to somebody else. And um, the US, of course, is in general the world's um, supplier of weapons. Okay, now there's an analysis done by the Conflict Environment Observatory and Scientists for Global Responsibility that estimated all the world's military industries and militaries and said that if you added them up, they would be the fourth largest emitter at over 5% of all emissions. I haven't done that math. I think it's in the sort, maybe in the ballpark, um, but I, I think it's uh, pointing to something really important. First of all, we need better numbers. We need to get countries to actually report their military missions. They haven't for the most part. Only four countries have ever reported their military emissions. Military industrial emissions are, are not generally reported. And the other thing it, it points out is that we haven't been talking about this as a sector. Okay, it, we need to think about it very seriously. Okay, and and the another thing that that occurs is military greenhouse gas emissions. Just the military emissions alone, it's a more much more carbon intensive sector than the civilian sector, and there are lots of reasons for that. But um, the point here is that this sector, if you make changes in it, will have ripple effects in the entire economy. Okay, so why don't we know much about military industrial emissions? It's partly because um, the DOD sent a paper to the White House in September 1997 saying that if you, if you reported those emissions, imposing greenhouse gas emissions limitations on tactical and strategic military systems would adversely impact operations and readiness. And they said you couldn't do that. That would change American hegemony, it would, it would mean that the United States wouldn't be preeminent. And so don't report, don't have any reporting in that. And they basically got what they wanted at Kyoto. Um, now I, I realize I'm just gonna speed up and I'm gonna um, just flip to some other things real quick. Yeah. And talk about, um, I, I've just said that the US DOD didn't want military emissions reported, and they weren't, for the most part, reported um, in the common reporting format. Now uh, they're voluntary, it's, and since 2015, it's voluntary to report your emissions. It's um, Four countries do it. But what's ironic here almost is, um, or maybe not ironic, is that uh, when it said that the, at the Kyoto Protocol negotiations that they didn't want the emissions reported, it was also the the military itself, the U.S. military, in particular the Office of Naval Research, which had funded much of the research, which helped us understand climate change. In the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, they were funding the most famous scientists working on this, Roger Revelle, Hans Suss. Charles Keeling were getting their money from the Office of Naval Research. The US military understood climate change very well because they paid for the science, is what I'm saying. And in the 1990s, they began to focus on it as something that would affect installations and operations. And then in the early 2000s, they began to think about climate change as a threat multiplier. And they say this very, very clearly in the 2014 Quadrennial Defense Review. So that's how they understand it. They think climate change has caused war is going to come to a neighborhood near you. 
And then they look at, here's the national intelligence estimate for 2021, and they look at the different effects of climate change on the world and human security, depending on how much the warming there is. And they see a very dire situation for most humans. But they also talk about the effect on institutions, which they've been talking about for since 1990, worried about it. And they worry in particular about bases which are at risk because of either sea level rise or storms or both. And here is the uh, famous destruction of Tyndall Air Force Base in 2018 by Hurricane Michael. And there was some question about whether or not it would be rebuilt and they decided to rebuild it. And they'll keep rebuilding it. So what we have it, it right now is a consensus view that says climate change will, will be a hazard. It's, it will cause instability and this instability may lead to conflict directly. So it's a threat multiplier. And here are the places where the national intelligence community believes that we're gonna see the most risk and that those are the darkest ones. And then, as you see, it's um, Central Africa looks not so great and lots of instability predicted there. And they fear that solar geoengineering will be tried by somebody and this will cause instability. So the view now, the consensus view is that climate change caused instability is not just possible, but likely. So here the arrow, the causal arrow is not that war causes climate change, but climate change will cause war. And that's basically where we're at right now. The consensus view is that, and I, I you can see it in their graphics. They're predicting conflict due to, to climate change. This is their climate risk analysis. The fists like this are, are the possible conflict areas. And this is, just read the blue here. Uh, the, the argument here is that climate change will converge with all sorts of other drivers of instability causing conflict. And then um, other countries will seek here to exploit climate change induced instability to erode the rules-based order that is central to the security and prosperity of the United States and its allies, right? So it's a dangerous world. And here's all of the documents that are telling us that it's a dangerous world caused by climate change. Climate change will cause instability. Here, NATO in uh, 2023 says climate change is a threat multiplier. It's not possible, but it is a threat multiplier that significantly shapes NATO's strategic environment. And they've opened the Center for Excellence to study it. The service branches are reacting to this environment finally in 2022 by reducing their emissions, and they've done so, and we can talk about that in Q&A. Um, some of their emissions are rather dramatic. This is the total emissions. They've reduced 28% in, since 2010, and we can I can tell you why. All right. They plan to adapt. Um, they're making progress, and they have lines of effort that will lead to uh, reductions, more reductions in emissions. And they're greening their fleet. This is 10% um, beef fat and uh, running the surface ships here. And the rest of it's conventional naval fuel, but 10% beef fat. So it's a green fleet. And they're producing renewable energy. So that's the big picture. Um, the, the military, in, in conclusion, is aware of climate change. They understand the problem because they paid for the research. Um, they've read it, they took it on board in the 1990s and began to uh, analyze it, think about how it would affect operations in the Arctic and elsewhere. They have, on the other hand, only recently recognized their contribution to emissions, which are significant. And if you add up all of the contributions, not just of militaries, but of military industry and all militaries, this is a significant contributor to climate change. 
and I end there. Well, that's very optimistic. Let's keep it up. Okay, great. Let's leave it. Yeah. Great. Thank you. That was fantastic. Um, I will lead with a couple of questions uh, and then I will hand over to the audience. I think the first question I have is about your conclusions, because in the conclusion to the book, you take us beyond the numbers to kind of push DOD on where you think they could do better. So first of all, can you tell us what is their inherent incentive to cut emissions? Because I think you, uh, that's an interesting point that you kind of touched on and secondly where do you push them to go further than they already are right um, so the the dod has an incentive to be fuel efficient because anytime they are, are making war they have to move the fuel to that place and moving the fuel to that place could put people at risk Right. And in fact, it, it has, and people have died moving fuel, for instance, from Pakistan into Afghanistan, or people, soldiers have died or been injured um, in Iraq when their tanks run out of fuel. And they, so they have an incentive for efficiency, right? And, and they have been thinking about this uh, alongside, thank you, the, the, uh, the problem of uh, climate change, but that's been their main incentive is is efficiency. It's not been, and it, it, they don't want to tell you that it's been um, climate change per se. They also um, want to be more robust and flexible. And you know, for instance, if you have batteries, you can be quieter. Um, your tactical vehicles can can be, um, uh, you know drive around semi undetected, I don't know, a large, it's, it, I, I believe they'd be seen by other means or heard by other means, but but these are things that they, they talk about. So that's part of the question you asked is what are their incentives, right? And what was the rest of it? The rest was what are your policy recommendations at the end about yeah. ensuring they cut even more than just what the logistic incentives are? Right. I, I think there's there are several things that can be done. First of all, um, to the extent that the United States and other countries are using less fossil fuel, that is less oil, less natural gas, you can stop defending that, right? Um, and you can pay what it takes to purchase that fuel. So, um, you know, there are tens of thousands of troops right now in the Persian Gulf defending access to oil. And it's really about price more than anything. It's about having a price that you you believe um, is reasonable to pay for that. So you could re close some of those bases. And in fact, the United States has moved some of its um, uh, material capability to Indo-Pacific Command just by virtue of being less concerned with what's going on in Iraq and Syria, though now they're, they've got another aircraft carrier in the Gulf for, for the current war between Israel and Gaza. So you could re, re, uh, stop defending access to oil, which we shouldn't be burning in any case. And um, we've been burning less of. So that's one thing that would reduce military spending potentially if you don't move those resources elsewhere. And uh, military spending is very correlated with emissions. And it would um, allow for other countries to reduce their military forces, right? And because what we know is that there's the action reaction dynamics. If I bring forces into a region and have lots of them and they're really well equipped, you're going to, of course, want to have nice, shiny new planes and other um, and missiles, and you will try to keep up. So this would diminish the arms races, uh, racing potentially. So those are a couple of steps. I also think that um, the and I don't talk about this very much in the book, but I think that to the extent that we're concerned about China, we shouldn't be concerned so much about China's commercial threat or threat, um, just use the language right there, commercial challenges to the West, let China rise economically um, it, to the extent that it's a military threat to its neighbors. Think about 
uh, ways of deterring, not through deep strikes and forces prepared for deep strikes, but deterrence through denial, make it so that um, China could not have an easy time in invading Taiwan if that if they were so interested. And I'm not clear that they are so interested. They'd like to get Taiwan to just you know come come over nicely. Um, and then regarding the NATO buildup in response to um, the invasion of Ukraine, I have a couple thoughts on that. One is that um, the call to get NATO countries to increase their, you know, actually follow through with the 2% commitment of um, GDP being spent on the military, I think is, is an overreaction to the extent that, or uh, because of the fact that um, I, I think it's a couple hundred thousand Russians have been killed and injured, and they've used the Russians have used up a lot of their war material. It's um, been destroyed or damaged in that war. And to def to modernize NATO in reaction to in response to a much diminished diminished Russian threat is an overreaction in my view. Um, U.S. and uh, NATO countries have adequate forces to deter an attack on NATO. They needn't build up. That That's my argument. I think, in fact, the forces could be reduced in some, you know, it's, I could go on, but that's the basic. <laughs> the basic reduce idea. the forces and yeah, reduce the emissions. I'm going to open up now. Um, please raise your hand and introduce yourself briefly and we'll collect if it's okay with you a couple of questions sure. at a time sure. to maximize student numbers. Hi, I'm Francesco. Um, is this on? Yes, we can hear you. Um, thank you so much for coming to us this evening. Um, so two questions, I'll try and be quick. The first one um, relates to before the First World War um, in, in Europe, Germany used to produce the most amount of potash fertilizer, which they exported a lot of it to the United States. And then when World War I kicked off, uh, they cut exports. And then the United States subsequently became self-sufficient in producing its fertilizer using kelp. Uh, they had DuPont investing millions and millions of dollars in producing kelp um, fertilizer, kelp-based fertilizers. Um, after World War I ended, um, that, that ended and the United States stopped producing it's uh, it's kelp fertilizer, which was obviously a lot better for the environment. I'll, if you could just speak onto that, that would be really interesting to hear your opinion about that. And then right. um, the second question is related to what you just mentioned now about NATO not needing to expand. Um, today, the Finnish, new, the new president of Finland, Alex Stubb, just announced after Trump's comments that um, he would be definitely willing to uh, increase domestic production of ammunitions and weapons. Uh, to like stand up to the Russian threats, and there's been a huge backlash, obviously in, in Europe, uh, based on the current situation. So, I agree. I, I idealistically agree with what you just said, but it doesn't seem like the reality. Thank you so much. Thanks, Francesco. Take one more question. Is there a woman with her hand up? Alternate genders? No. Good evening. My name is Julek. I'm an economist. I have two clarification for your just you know observation. The first one is. Could you uh, elaborate a bit more on the cost of the environment regarding to the space, the space wars and the, let's say, colonization of space and further on? And the second one, again, more a clarification. Is there some study on the cost of cyber war? Because, you know, all AI uses a, a huge amount of energy. So possibly is civilian energy, but possibly not. So I don't know if that is separate in your calculation and how do you foresee that? Thank you. We'll come back for another round for the next question. Okay. Yeah, I don't, I don't really have a comment on kelp. Um, I, I really don't, it, but I think there is so much going on with um, in this period between 1900 and you know the 1960s with innovations and the switching over from uh, naturally occurring things like using natural rubber for tires to 
petroleum-based rubber for tires or um, plastics for wood. This is a, a story that's not unique to kelp. And so that's all I have to say about kelp. I don't know anything about potash. So something to new to to learn about. I'm probably, I'll probably get really into it. Um, and then about um, Mr. Trump, I try never to say anything about what he says and um, people's reactions to him. Um, you know, the expansion of NATO, um, I, again, I think that's an overreaction. I think that it wasn't necessary, but standing up to Putin is necessary. Standing up to any aggressor is, I, I believe, um, you know, all of our benefits. I'm, I'm not a pacifist. I think that you have to respond. You have to defend against aggressors. Um, you know, the best industries for the military are Sweden and the UK and Germany. They've got the best military industrial complexes. Um, you know, perhaps Europe could be self-sufficient in weapons. Maybe that's part of what you're what is behind your question, weapons and ammunition? I don't know. I think that, um, uh, you know, shorter supply lines would be nice, but um, these are sort of technical questions that are in the weeds. I'm often very much in the weeds. You know, you I, look at me, I, I count emissions. I'm very nerdy weedy, but it, in the larger picture, I'd rather try to see uh, a rethinking of military doctrines and move to non-offensive defense of Europe that is defense by denial rather than defense by counter-offensive. So the old NATO doctrines, and in fact, current NATO doctrine is basically massive response, massive retaliation, counter-offensive. And, um, you know, you, you'd need different weapons for the kind of um, military doctrine that I'm talking about. So that's the level at which I'm prepared to answer you there. And then on um, the cost of the space wars, the the Air, US Air Force runs Space Command. So any emissions that, the, uh, that I've got for Space Command are inside the Air Force emissions. And um, that's a relatively new arrangement, of course. And then on, uh, and so I don't know, I haven't broken them out. I don't know. The answer is I don't know. And then on cyber war, that's a good question. Um, and, and it raises a larger question. So your question about cyber war is really, do we know what's the military part of that versus what is the part of cyber war or cyber operations that is handled by uh, a contractor? I, I don't think we understand all of the emissions of contractors of any part of the defense contracting sector. That is the people who supply the labor. So I don't know, is my answer. And I, I think it's an area that's ripe for research, more micro calculation by nerds. All right, thanks. I will get another round of questions. Put up your hand straight so I can just see who's got questions. Left. Hi, Great. my name is Josephine. Um, I would be interested in understanding more about, or kind of learning more about your research approach. So what, are, what is the methodology that you tend to use? What is your positionality as a researcher? And um, mm. are there any perks of law of doing the future researchers? Okay. Yeah, I'll go for it there. Okay. Um, hi, my name is Ruth. Thank you so much for sharing your research with us tonight. Um, I just had two questions for you, if that's all right. The first one was the graph that you showed us related to the private uh, corporations' contribution to um, emissions. You said that we could uh, speculate on why they have been decreasing over the years. If we could do that now, that would be great. Thank you. And um, the second question I had was just for you more personally, because you spoke about how 
you know, we don't have enough data on this topic. It's not spoken about enough. And then you spoke about how the DOD recognizes the issue, but that they're not really ready to see themselves as a sector. Just yourself, what was your initial exposure to this topic? Um, how have, you know, how, how is your research taken you uh, so far in this sort of DOD environment? And does it bring you to interesting conversations with DOD officials and how receptive they are to you and your research and potentially your policy implications for them. Thank you. Seems like more than one, two or three <laughs> questions. Yeah, is that there? I can do one more. Hello, everyone. Thank you for the lecture. Um, Sami from Sciences Po Lille. Um, two questions. I had one for uh, concerning Trump, but I leave it because uh, I don't want to be too, too pessimistic. The first one is, do you think that there might be an incentive to contract out, as you said, you do, we don't have the figures, so right. that would be a good way to, you know, impose yeah. that. And the other thing is about interagency. It mm -hmm. seems that the Biden administration uh, put a lot of uh, effort on new executive orders looking at the wall of government approach. Yeah. Could you tell right. us a little bit about that? Thank yeah. you very much. Okay. That's a good cluster. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, I'll start with the last one. In the fall of 2022, the Biden administration, was it 2022 or 2021? 2021 had that executive order that you're talking about. And it said that the entire government needed to reduce its emissions. And there was a net zero by 2050, right? But if you read deep into it, like paragraph 60 or whatever, deep into the executive order, maybe it's paragraph 200, I don't remember now. Um, it says that there's that you can have a national security exemption and that, that agency doesn't have to meet that goal. But on the other hand, the uh, services have set out goals. And in the case of the army, they're nearly there with their goal for reduction, which tells me their goals are not ambitious, right? Be because they stopped fighting a war. They're, they have a, uh, for the army and the air force and the Navy, they have baseline years, and those baseline years are in the middle 2000s, like 2008 or 2005. And those are peak fighting years, especially 2005. So you're, I mean, of course you're going to reduce uh, and you, you're going to be almost there. They were already in a downward trajectory. I think they could be much more ambitious. And then um, contracting out, that's some research I want to do with an economist who knows um, military contracting. So the, the I assume your question is, do we know the emissions of military contractors like Kellogg, um, Brown and Root and whoever else, executive outcome, whatever they are? Yeah, I don't. I don't know that. And But I do know that in some years, especially post-2011, there were more military contractors in the war zones than there were U.S. military. So that tells me that there's a lot of operational emissions that I haven't accounted for. And my story in the Pentagon Climate Change and War will be greatly revised if it's the case that emissions actually didn't go down as much as I thought. They were just sort of outsourced, like the cooking of meals. Okay. Um, then Ruth, um, why did military industry emissions decline? I think um, they declined in those years, which were recent years, because the U.S. was buying less and there was less demand. Other countries, um, there uh, may have been buying more, but not as much. The U.S. is by far the largest purchaser of those companies' equipment. And the other thing is they have, if you read their annual reports, all sorts of ways that they're trying to become more energy efficient and and the incentive is the same for everybody which is it's cheaper if you don't spend that much money on energy so that's part of the story right um there's no mystery there for me but it's interesting that that they have imbibed that and they talk about it um, there is some greenwashing in all of this and they could do more but um uh, you know, if you look at the raw numbers, they have reduced their emissions. I think it's impressive. 
And then um, I'm going to not answer your question about uh, what is it? Evolution of research. Oh, the GOD's response because I'm gonna I'm gonna um, collapse it with Josephine's question. Okay. Um, you asked about methods, positionality, and the flaws in my approach. Is that right? Oh, joys. I thought you said flaws. All right, you're coming for me. Um, okay, so um, the. Okay, so I got into this research because I taught an undergraduate course, the, the most exciting and interesting course I've ever taught on climate change with um, two scientists and two humanists. And I was the social scientist. I learned, is this being recorded? Okay, I, I learned a shit ton, okay? As we say in Wisconsin where I grew up, I learned so much by working with these scientists, right? And um, and that's how I got into this research, um, teaching undergraduates how to think about climate change. And it, the, the, we designed the course from scratch. And every year I tried to do something new and different. And one year I thought, oh, well, you know, what's the DOD's emissions? And I went to look and I couldn't find it. And that's how I started. I couldn't find the answer to a simple question. It wasn't easy. It wasn't obvious Then I learned why. And off I went. And then I realized I had to do the math myself. And doing the math, it's you can look, there's an appendix in the back of this book that talks about different methods for calculating. Yeah, it, you know, and different approaches that people take. It, it, just table after table, you too can learn how to calculate emissions. And I'm sorry for changing your, that's right. Um, so it's it's actually not that hard. What you need is the raw data. And I had to figure out where to get the raw data. That's what took me a long time. And there are a group of scholars in the UK. Um, one of them is Ben Neemark. Another is um, Oliver Bigger. They, and, and there's a couple of other people in their group. They got some declassified data from the DOD around the same time I was using unclassified data and they did the calculations based on the classified data and their numbers were not dissimilar, they were very close. So I felt confident at that time that my number was good and that their number was good. They were pretty close in terms of um, total emissions for that one year. They did one year, I did from 1975 to uh, then it was 2019, my first go, go at it. And then I kept going and I've got 2022, but I'm not calculating anymore because they've started reporting their emissions. Um, the obvious emissions. I I could just now I just say what they say, because when I do my math, it comes up with what they say. So just do what they say. Okay. So um, positionality and um, the reactions of the DoD. Right. I'll put those two together. Um, I I don't know exactly what you mean by positionality. But the way I understand it is what my job is as a scholar and um, as a, a person who cares about the world is to say what I see as clearly as I can and say why it's important. And um, it's the same way we approach the Cost of War project, which I'm the co-director of. Uh, it's basically just the facts, okay? Then you add some analysis and you say what the other alternatives are. And that right there is revolutionary because often we just take things for granted as the, the past uh, will be the present. It's present plus one. And I think there are alternatives. So, um, I, you know, I'm all about changing the world by analysis. And I've been doing that since I was a wee one. Um, you didn't mention my first book, which is 1987 Soviet military aircraft, which is a thousand pages, more than a thousand pages long and weighed six and a half pounds. And the review in the bulletin of the of atomic scientist, I think the first sentence was six and a half pounds. <laughs> It's it's not a coffee table book. It's a coffee table. 
Yeah. That really hurt, actually. Okay. And obviously, I remember it. Okay. But there was stuff in there. It wasn't just that what how big it was. Okay. I think I've answered. Have I answered? Oh, right. Oh, yeah. So then um, the Navy's really interested. The Navy's always sort of ahead uh, in terms of climate change for obvious reasons, right? Sea level rise, um, changes in ocean water salinity. They're really concerned about the Arctic opening up. Um, the Navy is really interested in this stuff. And the Naval, they have something called the Combined Naval Address, which is the Naval Postgraduate School, the Naval War College, um, uh, Annapolis, that is the, the Military Academy, uh, the Coast Guard School, and I think one or two other schools. They had me come uh, virtually and give an address because you can't do this in all those places at the same time to those to those groups of people. And then afterwards, there was an off-the-record conversation with the faculty of those places. That was interesting. That's all I can say. Great. We have a couple of questions that build on this point in the chat. So I'm going to ask them and then go back, but I will. There's enough time. Um, so Leah is asking, do you expect military emissions to ever be completely transparent? What incentive does a military need to calculate and disclose its emissions? And you just suggested they are. So mm -hmm. um, yeah. maybe you can elaborate on that. And secondly, Anastasia asks, do you know if the green commitments of the US Army, and I, I don't know if they have made green commitments, mm -hmm. but they have, have been affecting its military decisions, mm -hmm. in particular in regard to the war in Ukraine. So our concerns essentially about, mm -hmm. about climate emissions ever shaping military decisions. Um, and then if it's okay, we'll take one third question. Yeah, my name is Sam. Um, in, in, the, in what you outlined, I feel like there's an inherent sort of contradiction between the prediction that climate-induced wars will break out and the military on this trajectory of reducing emissions. So in, in a future where if the U.S. military is involved in climate-induced wars, can it possibly continue to reduce emissions? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, on transparency, the, there is a group of non-governmental organization actors who are trying to get full transparency on all countries' military emissions. And this effort started in, in Glasgow in 2021. It continued in Sharm el-Sheikh at the Conference of the Parties and again in Dubai. And in Glasgow, I'm part of this group and we were sort of really out in the fringes of the meeting. In Sharm el-Sheikh and then later at Bonn, they got into the UN Framework Convention um, zones, right? They have blue zones and green zones. And I can't remember which um, is the where the diplomats hang out. But the diplomats go everywhere. And then in uh, Dubai this year, we were again closer to the action. And what's really important about that is that there's a larger um, interest in military emissions that's building in the environmental movement, and they're pushing for greater transparency. So I think that there will be, to answer the online question, um, transparency and then be pushed by the activists, you know, um, Climate Action Network is interested in this. The Women's International League for Peace and Freedom wants greater transparency. Uh, the United States has begun to publish most of its numbers and sometimes broken them down by service, and that's very helpful. Um, you can do some calculations on basis. So this is really important, I think. We'll get, we're getting greater transparency. We have to keep pushing for that. So that it's not just four countries that report their emissions every now and then, but it's all countries. And we talk about military industrial emissions. So I think it's possible and we're getting, getting closer. Um, does the commitment to greening the military affect its decision-making?
Well, I think we have to think about what kind of decisions that they're making, you know, about whether or not to buy a certain kind of um, aircraft, uh, maybe. Um, you know, the United States first tested alternative fuel in aircraft, I think it was a C-130 in around 2008, 2009, and they haven't switched since then. So I don't see a lot of real rapid change there. Um, the Great Green Fleet with the 10% beef fat, they could have, you know, kept those surface ships on 10% beef fat. They're not. They could have moved to some other fuel, maybe increased the amount of beef fat. I don't know. Um, but but it's not really rapid. It's not affecting procurement, I think. it's it, They did um, buy a lot of new L LED light bulbs and put them on ships, and that's actually a dramatic reduction in electricity that's required to be produced. So and those those are small decisions that um, lead them to have greater capacity to make war um, because they have more fuel left at the end of the day. Um, does it affect, does, does greening affect strategy? It might if there is a decreased interest in defending access to Persian Gulf oil. That's the big one. Okay, last... Um, is there a tension between reducing military emissions and the belief that conflict is coming to a neighborhood near you? Okay. First of all, I don't know that conflict is coming to a neighborhood near you because of climate change. That's the, the evidence for that is weak, right? It's, there's not strong evidence saying that, um, uh, drought or flood-induced migration leads to conflict. Um, Marwa Daoudi wrote a book on the Syrian civil war that sort of takes apart the sort of that and says, well, no, that's not the cause. The causes of war are so much more complex than, than that. Um, so uh, that's the first thing. I, I wouldn't accept the premise Okay, but let's say that military um, organizations are required to respond to disasters or, um, you know, are the sort of the rescuers of last resort or maybe first resort because we don't have anything else, right? Um, I would say that's not an efficient use of a military, Right. We could have much more efficient and effective rescuers and responders who are trained and and um, we give them the resources for that. Every time a firefighter um, in the far west of the United States is actually taking time away from the military training, the military doesn't like that. And there are much more effective firefighters out there for wildfires that that's their job. And maybe we should pay them adequately to do that. So I think it's about efficiency. Um, so those are those are the that's my response. Okay. Hopefully that's clear. Great. We have a couple more questions. So Daria. Hi, thank you so much. I'm Daria. Um, I have two questions. One again goes to transparency. You briefly mentioned that during Kyoto, the US was pushed that uh, military emissions are not to be included. So mm -hmm. I assume it follows that none of the countries have to report mm -hmm. their military right. emissions. Is that correct? Yeah. Um, oh, so, do, sorry. do you want me to answer that? or I can go with my second, sorry. Second, go ahead. Go with Whatever, second, I don't know. Go with um, the second. The second one you mentioned, there was a slide where you had something highlighted in blue mm -hmm. that was about the threat perception of the US military. And you mentioned something like um, countries will mm -hmm. exploit climate-based changes mm -hmm. and eradicate the root space order. And I was wondering if mm -hmm. you had insight into what exactly that refers to, what kind mm -hmm. of exploitation mm -hmm. um, is meant by that. Mm -hmm. Thank Maybe you. Another question here. And does anyone else have a question they want to ask? Now's your last Thank question. you. Uh, professor, thank you very much for this eye-opening presentation. 
My name is John Kojan, and I teach a course here on global financial institutions. Mm -hmm. My question is, early on in your presentation, you showed the numbers, and something like 59 million uh, tons uh, em of emissions. Mm -hmm. Does that include the supply chain that goes mm -hmm. into that 59? So yeah. like a bolt that is mined and then manufactured and then sent to the jet manufacturer? Right. Okay. Or is it curtailed at some point in that process? Okay. Good. Okay. All right. So um, annual emissions that I'm reporting up there with those with that chart or whatever it's called, yeah, the graph, um, those are operational and installation emissions. Okay. They're not scope three emissions. That is the supply chain or the effects of um, any of the activities of the military, the destruction, okay, or reconstruction, whatever it is. So right. the actual number would be the multiple of that. That's, that's true. Yeah, and that's, and my estimate of US military industrial emissions, which is in the book, suggests that um, if, in any one year, the, the number's a number. Okay, so in 2022, it was 48 million metric tons CO2 equivalent for the um, operations and installations of the military. Then we have to add the military industrial inputs to that. My estimate is that it's the same or larger. So one to 1 1.5 times so then I tell you the annual emissions are around a hundred something million metric tons a year of the supply chain. But again, that doesn't tell you all the scope three. That tells you part of it. So, so far, yeah, and, and I don't want to double count, right? I want to just sort of say, here's what I know for sure. And so that number that's in the book is an estimate based on the top um, 14 contractors. Right, and the and this and related to the size of the U.S. military industrial workforce, I think it's fifteen percent of manufacturing is um, in the military industry. Okay, but, but of course, manufacturing isn't the entire U.S. economy. Okay, uh, then the question about. Is, yeah, ex, ex, well, exploiting the rules-based order and um, Kyoto. Okay, so the the idea that they have when they talk about exploiting the rules-based order is that some revisionist power, and by revisionist power, they mean something like China or um, Russia, who, who doesn't like the rules-based order, um, that is the liberal Western-dominated, you know, democracy, all that good stuff, order, free trade, um, human rights, will uh, take advantage of climate change to make hay while the sun shines, literally. And the, the Russians have talked about, um, sort of using outdated information, I think, um, the fact that they will gain some area for growing wheat and other things as the climate warms. Of course, the methane that's released from that um, melting of permafrost, making that land arable, is a disaster. It's runaway climate change. Um, so that's that's the idea. Or the other thing that they're talking about is somebody deploying solar geoengineering as a kind of um, way to make their region cooler, control their weather, um, control the, the dominant temperature, and that could have effects which are deleterious to another region of the world, or um, could start runaway um, or cascading effects which are extremely dangerous for the world. I mean, solar geoengineering is, it's a crapshoot and it's really dangerous. 
and and somebody doing it without really thinking it through either a corporation or um, a government is the concern there and of course the united states wants to be in charge of all that right so if anybody's going to do solar geoengineering it should be the u.s air force okay then you have the question about transparency in kyoto okay so the the um What the DOD did at uh, at Kyoto was they went with the U.S. chief negotiator, Stuart Eisenstadt, and um, negotiated sort of on the side and pushed him to negotiate an exemption for most emissions reporting by militaries. And they got it. And what, what specifically they got was um, you don't have to report multilateral operations. You don't have to report um, bunker fuels, that is fuel that's offshore or in the air. And most U U.S. military operations are multilateral, so you don't report that, right? And you can report some of the emissions um, if you want to for aircraft and so on, but you can put that, you can concatenate that, lump it in with commercial aircraft, commercial aviation. And so if you look at the United States submission, they have two submissions. One is the EPA submission, and then there's the other, the common reporting format submission and you can't tell what's going on. That's the short of it. I mean you can you can sort of figure out some things that are going on, but it's not really it's not really uh, transparent. So there's no transparency. I'd like to see transparency. Then the, the question about um uh, no I think that's it. I think that was it. That's it. Whoop. I know I think you threw <laughs> All right. You've had thanks, enough of me. Thanks for a fantastic talk. I think it was really enlightening to go into such depth about what the US military's emissions are. It's something I know, I mean, we talk about over lunch, but there's just like, I'm not really aware of any other studies out there that do this as, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> certainly systematically. Um, I wonder if you had any last words of wisdom for science students here. Some of them have worked in the military or have are interested in working in the State Department or interested in working mm -hmm. in their own homes, whether it be in Germany or Austria or uh, somewhere else in the world in, in the foreign service of their countries. Um, given the work that you've done, I wonder if you had any final thoughts. Yeah, I do, actually. Um, I think it's really important to think outside your boxes. First of all, figure out what your boxes are and then think outside them. I'm trying to, to you know, I'm trying to turn your world upside down, right? If I tell you, the dominant story is war is uh, the consequence of climate change. And then I tell you that war causes climate change. That I'm hoping I'm flipping your paradigm up around a little bit. You have to do that. You know, the, the world's in a parlous condition to, to use a fancy word for saying it's really in a precarious, dangerous, bad place. And there's more conflict in 2022, 2023 than in, in, in the several previous years than were there were in the past. We're not seeing a reduction in conflict as we were in the 1990s. I think it's really important that we think outside our boxes and take risks with peace, take risk with negotiation, stand up to bullies, but uh, that I, I think we have to speak and think outside boxes. And that means really rethinking all these military doctrines that we have and the legacy forces that are associated with them. So a legacy force and a legacy doctrine is the, the um, 10,000 ships, I'm sorry, the 10,000 um, troops or more than 10,000 troops that the US has in the Persian Gulf, or it's the bases in Hawaii, or it's um, you know uh, the massive nuclear modernization that the United States is engaged in. Why are they modernizing these nuclear forces? Because they're getting older and they have to change the tritium and but do they have to make new nuclear weapons? And the use of 10 of these would be devast at once on cities would be devastating. Can we not think outside those that legacy mentality? That's that's what I would say. As my benediction to you going out there changing the world, young people. That's right. Well, thank you once more for fantastic. 
And I hope we can have you back at uh, Sai Syrup in Bologna sometime in the near future. We can woo you with our great weather compared to the UK. Yeah. Good oh, food. yeah. There was sun. <laughs> I saw sun today. Thank you. Thank you for the sun. That was good enough.